Praise the Lord. Man, so true, isn't it? It's all for Him. Aren't you glad you're a Christian tonight? Amen. You know, the more I see people, opinions in the world, and I'm not trying to fight anybody else's opinion. Everybody can have as many opinions as they want. I am just so thankful that I am serving God. I am just so thankful that, that God has chosen me. Come on, somebody say amen. He's chosen you. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you haven't tonight, to Psalm 4. We're going to start. Evening devotion, security, and stress. We've been talking about this. We've been talking about David, and he's writing this psalm. And, of course, we're going to talk about the way I've been teaching it. We're going to talk about the prophecy based on 1904, Psalm 4. And then we're going to talk about why David wrote it. And then, of course, the application to us. And so tonight, I have been telling you that in our study that the psalms are an emotional journey, as well as a prophetic and scriptural one. Don't miss the fact that you can open up the psalm book anytime you're feeling terrible and you can read something and find yourself not feeling terrible anymore. Right. Understand that it is a prescription for life. And so psalms are something that should be your friend. You should be able to, to, to course through those psalms whenever you have a problem or even whenever you want to just praise God. So the psalms are an amazing, an amazing pill, if you will, a spiritual pill to help you no matter what you're going through. So let me also tell you that you will learn a great deal about your emotional wellness uh, or a lack of it uh, during these studies. So it's going to hit us. Uh, you, will, you will save on doctor bills, I believe. And I believe you'll save on uh, them coming and going. I believe if you really take God at His word, many times He can take care of you before anybody else can. Somebody say amen. Because through a series of emotional evaluations, which I'm going to give you, by the way, you will diagnose your own mental well-being. Not tonight, because it's going to be a little too lengthy, but I did have one for tonight. But we're going to give you some things that will actually let you assess yourself mentally and spiritually so you can get some help. And we all need help. Somebody say amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need help. And now you tell them back, not more than you do. So Psalm 3 was about morning devotions, fear, and faith. And I do believe that, that David wrote these rather quickly in times of trouble. It was about morning devotions and faith or fear. Obviously, David was fearing. We know the title talks about him fleeing from Absalom. So he's leaving Absalom. He's leaving the palace. He's abandoning everything that God had promised him in a covenant, by the way. And so he's abandoning it all because his life's in jeopardy. His son Absalom has, uh, has, is pursuing him and he's, he's defiling him, his concubines and everything else. You'll see some more verses on that tonight. So tonight we're going to study Psalm 4. How does that fit in? Well, it does fit in. And you'll have to wait until I get through the historical aspect of it to see how it fits in. But if it's right in line with, 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 uh, with David's, uh, David's first psalm, matter of fact, tonight is evening devotions. Last, last week was morning devotions. So tonight is the evening he's writing this. And so I want you to see that tonight. But eventually we'll get there. So before we go, let me just talk to you about what happened in 1904. You know, Psalm 1 is 1901, Psalm 2, 1902, Psalm 3, 1903. And by the way, these are things that I'm not stretching anywhere. I'm just taking those historical facts and those historical headlines and I'm bringing them to you. So Psalm 3, 4, and 5 are in David's writings are related. They're all related. I believe they all happen pretty quickly and they all have to do with his problems, his initial problem with Absalom, persecution from Absalom and Absalom's wicked advisors, as we will see. So prophetically, we should see an increased stirring, an increased persecution and an increase happening against the Jews in 1903, 1904, 1905. That's what's happening to David. David is, if this is prophetic, then this is what we should see in the headlines in 1903, 1904, 1905. We should see the Jews being pursued by their enemies. How many are following me? How many are following me? And so we should see that happening. So it should happen around the world, by the way, against the Jews. And we do see that in those, in those years. Turmoil worldwide concerning the reestablishment of the nation of Israel is happening. The protocols of the elders of Zion in 1903 uh, is, are whipping the world into an anti-Jewish frenzy. And the Zionist movement, started by Theodore Herzl, are looking for a solution. They're looking for a homeland. That was on the headlines in 1903, 1904, 1905, as you will see. So what do the headlines actually say, and the articles say, in the secular news about 1904. Well, they tell us a lot. Uh, this first one in 1904 is, is May, and it says, Russians lose ship, admiral, and 600 men. Scripture says that God will bless those who bless Israel and will curse those who curse Israel. Russia had many problems at this time and were at war with Japan. They're the ones that initiated the protocols of the elders of Zion. And it's no coincidence to me that you read in the headlines that as soon as they cursed Israel and it was a worldwide curse, the protocols of the elders of Zion is a, is a, is a blasphemy. It's, hor it's horrific. Blaming the Jews for It's a satanic plot to blame the Jews for everything, which is still alive today. As soon as that happens, Russia starts losing battles and starts 
starts losing a lot of their territory. So they, Russia started persecuting the Jews in 1903. Their doors of persecution opened. In hindsight, we can see many things in history that are not just isolated events. Uh, we're going to show you that, that Russia really kind of got devastated in 1904. They were in a war with Japan and they lost the battleship. They were in a war with Japan and they lost some land. And so Japan actually defeated Russia in 1904. Then we see, and we'll get back to that. Then we see in July, the headlines of July. I know it's too small for you to read, but that is the actual headline. The Zionist movement was started by Theodore Herzl, uh, who died in July of 1904. Theodor Herzl was the founder of the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish state in Palestine. He died on July 3rd, 1904. He was 44 years old, very young. He saw the persecution coming, so he started a worldwide organization to obtain a homeland for the Jews. Now, he's a national hero in Israel today, but he was pursuing a homeland, and he was going to accept Uganda, and he was going to accept something in Argentina, as the Israeli homeland. Now, follow me for a second, if you would. So he, he saw that. He's a national hero in Israel. In 1896, Herzl published Der Jugendstaat, a pamphlet describing a separate Jewish state as a solution to anti-Semitism in Europe. Herzl also organized an annual Zionist World Congress. Uh, Herzl met several times with the Ottoman Sultan in Constantinople in an effort to obtain a charter permitting colonization of Palestine, but no avail. In other words, Israel. Herzl thought he had some great ideas about where to put the Jewish state. And so we see this article coming out in 1904 in August. Russians insist massacres in Poland are prompted by Jewish aggression. So again, we're watching this bounce from one thing to another. Now Russia is again blaming the Jews. In September, we see something else happening. We see Russia imperial decree defines civil rights of the Jews. They're starting to clamp down on the Jews. Also in September 1904, New York, uh, by the way, I just threw this in, a woman, this was the worst thing happening in New York in 1904, a woman was arrested for smoking cigarettes on 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue. In December of 1904, and we're going right down the line here, in December of 1904, this is what happens. Um, Korea, despite, here's the headlines. Um, Korea, despite the loss of 11,000 men, Japanese gained last hill of Port Arthur. Uh, Japan, Japanese destroy Russian fleet at Port Arthur. Only torpedo boats left. Russia's Grand Duke Sergius resigns after loss to liberals. Japanese warships quit Port Arthur to cut off Russian Baltic fleet advance, and they do that. So 1904 was a year of political unrest, but it was also centered on Russia and its programs to end the Jewish, uh, Jewish state. The leadership of the World Zionist Movement Looking to secure a homeland for the Jews, Herzl, uh, was split by two trains of thoughts in 1904. Some people under the group started by Herzl wanted a separate homeland, uh, but others did not want a separate homeland, but wanted to assimilate into their own nations. They wanted to blend in and forget about being born Jewish. They wanted to become Russians or they wanted to become Germans. So the Zionist movement started to, to, to see some splinters even in the Jews. Some of them said, yes, we want a homeland. Others said, no, we want to stay right where we are and we want to assimilate. We want to blend in. And so basically what's going on, the word, uh, we see something happening in Psalm 4 too. It says this, how long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? And so it's talking about some interesting scriptures here. It's also saying this. It says, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, the Lord will hear when I call to him. So one of the things in verse 2 in the King James says, talks about leasing. Uh, there's a word leasing. It's not in this one. It's a different translation. But the word leasing, it means falsehood. Maybe that verse is talking about the split in the Zionist movement. Herzl presents an option to establish homeland in East Africa at first. Uh, how many know that that was not God's will? How many know that? Can you imagine us taking a journey uh, in Sunday to East Africa, to Israel? That's where it was going to be. It was going to be in Uganda, and so Israel would have been called Israel Africa. And so he, that's where they were going to do it. And Herzl was all up for that. He wanted to get that done. And he wanted to get Israel nation. It didn't matter where it was. He wanted to first Palestine, the original homeland. But he was settling for anything because the Jews were being persecuted. So uh, God wanted Israel to have a homeland, but it was not supposed to be in Africa. Somebody say amen to that. There's too much prophecy about it. Uh, so Palestine was not opening up. And, it's, and uh, so some wanted to blend into the societies and others wanted to go just anywhere that would be given to them to stop the persecution. Another Zionist, Baron Hirsch, wanted to put the Holy Land in Argentina. And Y.L. Pinkerston, an influential Zionist, said, not a Holy Land we need, but we need our own land and it doesn't matter where it is. So the problem in 1904 was where to go. But Psalm 4, in fact, the Bible is relating in 1904, it said that the Lord had set them apart. It says that. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call. He wasn't looking for them to assimilate. He was looking for them to set, set apart as somebody different. So we watched that. 
Herzl submitted the, the Uganda proposal for consideration, and two months later he died. The British government had offered the entire country of Uganda to the Jews in 1904. In 1904 they said you can have the entire country, the British owned it, you can have the entire country of Uganda. According to Wikipedia regarding the Zionist movement, it says this, when Herzl failed to obtain a charter from the British, to, Turkish Sultan, he directed his diplomacy towards Britain, but the British offered him to investigate the possibility of Jewish colonization in Uganda, the so-called Uganda Scheme nearly split the Zionist movement. The Russian Zionists accused Herzl of betraying the Zionist program. Although Herzl was re reconciled uh, with his detractors, he died soon after a broken man with a broken heart. When the, se when the Seventh Zionist Congress convened in 1905, they rejected Uganda's scheme and Israel Zangwili formed a Jewish territorial organization for a goal of which was to seek territory anywhere for a Jewish nation. Had Herzl had his way, this is where the Holy Land would, have been, would be today in the heart of Africa, in Uganda. And it was very, very close to happening. So, you remember Entebbe, uh, you remember that the, the uh, Jews of Entebbe, the Eli Amin, that's Uganda. And so Herzl died that same year. Was God angry with the Zionist movement? Was he removing Herzl like he removed Moses to get his people where he wanted them? Because Herzl was extremely influential. Had Herzl lived, he would have put Israel in Uganda. Even though the Zionist movement was great, and even though he's a hero to the Zionist movement, to the Jews, he would have pushed for Uganda. Now, let me just show you something, just to give you a little bit of what's happening. 1904. Theodore Herzl dies in 1904. Baron Hirsch, who wants to put the Holy Land in Argentina, dies in 1896, before it comes up. We know that Y.L. Pinkerson dies in 1905. Israel Zangui dies in 1906. All these men were young men when they died, and every one of them were pushing and were leaders of the Zionist movement and leaders to try to get a holy land anywhere other than Israel just so they can get someplace. Listen, God will remove anybody he wants to remove to get his job done, even the ones that think they're doing his job. How many are understanding this? So we're watching it. Ultimately, the World Zionist Organization chose to work toward a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Without these men in the scene, they started to gather together and said, you know what? We don't need to go anywhere there. We need to, we need to work for something in, in uh, Palestine. By the way, Britain owned Palestine. In 1917, they'd actually give them a charter for it. It's called the Ball Floor Declaration. It's 101 years old today, this year. And so we'll talk about that in 1917, and you'll see prophecy that shows that. So shortly, what we happen is basically they're going towards a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the original land of promise. This is the land. If you didn't go to Palestine and they didn't go to Israel, the Bible would be a lie. Because there's so many promises about Zion, about, about Mount Zion, which is a specific location in Jerusalem. There's so many prophecies about it. So I'm sure the prophecy uh, lined up with that, and I'm sure people realized that, man, this, if this happened, then that Bible would be worthless because the Old Testament has so many promises to the Jews of their homeland in Israel, which was now called Palestine. So, we know that they came to uh, dedicate uh, themselves to bringing about the state of modern Israel. And there was an aliyah that happened in 1904. People started to move to some of the areas in what we now know as Israel. Jews started to move there. Even though, there wasn't a, even though they weren't looking for citizenship, they moved there before it was ever even a nation. So you saw this, this land start to get a liar, people coming in, means to go up, coming into this area that's called Palestine. They're starting to come in, Jews from all over the world. God's using it almost like a migration, and he's bringing them together. And he's saying, he said in Psalm 4 too, that I have set you apart. And they were actually reacting to that all over the world. That to me is more than coincidence. Come on, somebody say amen. So could the reference of Psalm 1, Psalm 4, 1, say this, When I call, give me answers, God take my side. Once in a tight place, you gave me room, now I'm in trouble again. Grace me, hear me. Psalm 1, that's from the message. The message translates Psalm 4, verse 1, like this. When I call, give me answers, God take my side. And that's what was happening. They were dividing up sides, where to put Israel. And it says, once in a tight space, you gave me room. Now I'm in trouble again. Grace me, hear me. Of course, David's writing that for a different reason. But obviously, you can look at it in 1904 for Israel. And so we're watching it. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in a distress uh, Psalm 4, 1 says in the, in the King James, it, uh, it's a veiled reference to the Zionist decision in 1904 to settle Israel at, as the official uh, Jewish homeland. So the Jews of 1904 were in a tight spot, a very tight spot. Could the declaration of Psalm 4, 3 mean something? But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself 
the Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now they were crying unto the world that we need Palestine for our homeland. We need the original site of Israel as our homeland. The Psalm 4 parallel with 1904 saying God's hearing them because they're saying that we want to be, that we want to be set apart and the Lord will heal me, hear me when I call for that. That's what they're asking for. Verse 6 says this, There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. And so people in the world were saying they don't have the right to declare that nation. They were saying it way back when. Of course, England owned it at that time. By war, they owned it. So verse 6, who will show us any good? Uh, will it be a foreshadow of the 1903-1906 programs where the world was, was going against them to persecute the Jews all over the world? And look at the last verse in verse 8 uh, for, the, for the prophecy. I will both lay down me down in peace and sleep for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. The Lord makes me dwell in safety. The word dwell there is Yeshav. It means to settle down back home. It means to go back home. To settle down, go back home. He's bringing them back to Israel. And in 1904, it's Psalm 4, it's paralleling that. And by the way, safety is the word batash. It means the cities of refuge. The cities of refuge are only found in Israel. So Psalm 4 directly tells us that God's bringing them back home to the cities of refuge. That's, the, that's where that dwell in safety is. It's the same word, batach. So it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing prophecy. It's proving, number one, there's persecution against the Jews. Psalm 4 talks about persecution. It's talking about God setting them apart. They're looking for their own homeland. It's talking about them settling down, which means going back home. And it's talking about their safety, which means the cities of refuge, the Hebrew word batash, which, is all, which are only found in Israel. So Psalm 4 parallels the headlines of 1904. Now it takes a lot to extract that. It takes a lot to take the, the, the uh, Hebrew out of there. It takes a lot to look at these charts of all the headlines. But trust me, it's all the way down the line showing that God has a pro prophecy in Psalm 4 to, for 1904. So, okay, let me switch gears for you for a second. So, amazingly, is, that is, David wasn't talking about 1904 when he wrote Psalm 4. That's prophetic spiritual utterance. So, we know that. He was thinking and talking about Absalom. Even though this is re relative to Jew, and I think I'm, I think the parallel for the 1900s to the Psalms are absolutely amazing. I don't know about you, but I think they're absolutely amazing. Wait, it gets better and better and better because you'll see it all over, all the way down the line. But as amazing as that is, David doesn't know about. He's writing that and it's prophecy, but he does know, He's not aware of the Holy Spirit inspiring him with prophecy. He's writing from his own emotions, and so basically he's he's writing about Absalom. He's writing about himself and how he feels. His rebellious son who is trying to establish a bogus, a bogus rule in Israel. Think about it. Absalom's trying to establish a bogus rule in Israel. Psalm 4. Prophetically, the world's trying to give Israel a bogus country. How many are with me? They're trying to establish a rule for Israel. You can see the parallel. So David's, uh, David's people were under, were under his command and, and now he's being forced out. Uh, so I want you to understand... Absalom won David's people over. He would stay in the gate. We told you last week. He would, he would schmooze with them. He would tell them that he's there. David hasn't set anybody up as a gatekeeper, but he's there. They can come on his problems. So he's, he's endearing them to himself. Psalm 4 is one of three psalms that David writes under the duress of Absalom's revolt. It has a teaching theme, just like the rest of the psalms we've studied. And by the way, the psalms all have a teaching theme. Look at the, where we've gone so far and where we're going. Psalm 1 is, which way are you going? Psalm 2 what is this world coming to? Psalm 3 was morning devotions for your faith. Tonight, evening devotions, security or stress? And by the way, stress is a killer. Somebody say amen. And Psalm 5 is prayer for protection. So if you ever need protection, when you get to Psalm 5, you're going to want to note that. So we see this. It's also grouped with the following psalms because it is suitable for praying or singing at times of various mental strains. And so we can group them together. We told you about the books, book 1, book 2. Psalm 4, 5, 11, 28, and 41 are prayers. They're actually prayers. Conflict resolution. Raise me up when you're feeling bad. Look at Psalm 55, 59, 64, and 70. Fight or flight. What do I do in this situation? Should I run away or should I fight it? Deliver and defend. God's answer to verbal violence. If somebody's a, if there's a woman here today or a man that's in a household and you're getting verbally abused, you want to read Psalm 64. Uh, Psalm 70 is a prayer to confuse the confuser. When the enemy comes at you, that's a prayer to confuse Satan, excuse me, and his demons when they come at you. Listen, some of these are extremely good weapons for us. Somebody say, Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 109. How to pray when you're falsely accused. How many of you ever been falsely accused? You should have been reading Psalm 109. It helps you. Trust me. Uh, Psalm 120. When the going gets tough. 140. Prayer for deliverance. 141. Praying against deeds of the wicked. 
In Psalm 142, abandoned by all but God when you're lonely. Uh, these are the Psalms that have a, a direct applications to our lives. So Psalm 4 is a Psalm of security in times of stress. Now I'm not going to ask how many people are under stress tonight. I'm not going to give you a stress test. We're not going to bring a, we're not going to bring a treadmill up here. But you know when you're under stress. When you're under stress, trust me, your whole body goes into a fight or flight mode. When you're under stress, it's the worst thing that can happen to your body because it promotes cancer, it promotes heart disease, it promotes stroke, it, it promotes so many different diseases just because of stress. So we need to get rid of stress. So if you're under stress, not only do you want to listen to my study tonight, whether you're here or at home, you want to memorize Psalm 4. You want to put it into your heart and into your spirit. So the Bible, and especially this psalm, is an evening devotion, security, and stress. And notice it's the evening devotions. I've talked to this, about this before. Most of your stress comes at night. You know, how many of you wake up and, man, you can't sleep? Come on, raise your hands. How many of you go to sleep? Some of you did not raise your hands. I know you sleep. How many go to sleep? And how many sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about something that's stressful? That's, this is what David did. He's running from Absalom. You think he got a good night's sleep? Well, he's saying he did in Psalm 3, but it's only after Psalm 4 that he gets this good night's sleep. And so he's talking about this stressful feeling. Thank you for relieving my stress. <laughs> so he's talking about this stressful feeling, and he writes another psalm. I think, and I have no way to prove it, that in the middle of the night he was under stress, he got up and wrote this psalm. Now, it's kind of interesting to me because it kind of fits the whole scenario. So the Bible, and especially the psalm, is not about the, phil the uh, philosophical question of the existence of God. That's not what it's about. But rather the personal question of the character of God. Even though you may believe in God, is he going to help you in your times of stress? See, the real question we ask, like David asked, isn't whether or not God exists and rules the universe. We don't ask that. It's whether or not God exists in your life at a specific time and rules your comings and your goings. It's not does God, does God uh, exist eternally or universally that bothers us. It's rather that will he help me personally when I need him. You know, we all believe in God. We all believe that are here. We believe that God exists. We believe he made everything. But will he help you in your time of deepest stress? That's a personal question that we all ask. So David answers the question. Uh, David's in a mess. His kingdom has been taken away from him. His people have entered a false allegiance. His concubines have been defiled. His, his throne has been taken by another, promised to him by God. He's running for his life, and the day hasn't been a good day. We can look at, at 2 Samuel and, talk, and see what happens. And the king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king shall appoint. And the king went forth to David and all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. And the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was afar off. Actually, where he went was he left Jerusalem and he went eastward. He went across the Jordan River because it was hard for Absalom to follow him. And he went to a place that we would later know in the New Testament near Bethabara where, where John baptized Jesus. So he's across it. He's in what today would be the uh, nation of Jordan. So he's getting as far away as he can because you know Absalom's going to send an army after him. 2 Samuel. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel. He's his counselor. Give counsel among you what we shall do. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go ye unto the father's concubines, which he has left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art, art aboard of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went into the father's concubines in sight of all Israel. Now some of you that are going to Israel, this is going to be very important. This verse you're going to want to remember. Because we're going to go to Milo. We're going to go up the, the side of the, of the old wall of, Jeru of Jerusalem and to the side of the old wall where the pinnacle is. We're going to take a left and we're going to go down. They just found David's palace. On that palace is a stone barrier that comes up. It's called Milo. So David's palace was about 300 feet underneath or lower than the Temple Mount. So his palace, because you would never build your palace where, above God's house. So the temple mounts up here, and literally David's house is down here. So when they spread a tent, what they're actually talking about, it's a flat roof, they're all flat roofs. They actually spread a tent so that all of Israel up here that are worshiping God going into the temple can look down onto the king's house and see Absalom defiling ten women. This is very, very literal. And so when you're in Israel, remind me, I'll show you that. 
I'll show you exactly where it was. So there you have this bird's eye view of him doing this. And so this is how, and we know, David was on that housetop when he saw Bathsheba, so she lived lower down. And Zion is actually like this. It's a peak. It goes like this. You have the Temple Mount up here. This is all Zion. This is the Gihon Spring down here. You have the Temple Mount up here. You have David's house right here. And Bathsheba lived in the town, which was right here, that was building up called Zion. So he could look on her. They could look on Absalom. So this is a very literal verse. So he's doing something in the sight of all the Israel. So everyone knows that David hates him. David has to hate him. Although he doesn't, everybody thinks he does because he took something that was very intimate of David's. How many are getting this? So, I want to set it up for you. So, he's running for his life, David is. The day hasn't been a good one. Psalm 4 is his nightly devotion amid massive stress. So, the first thing we want to see as we divide this out is this. So, the evening devotions. First of all, the acceptance. The Lord hears the holy. That's Psalm 4, 1 to 3. Assurance. The godly trust the Lord, Psalm 4, 1, 4 to 5. And absoluteness, safety in the Lord alone, Psalm 4, 6 to 8. So let's talk about acceptance first. Psalm 4, 1 to 3. And I know we're going over some of these verses over and over again because they're different applications. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me. Hear my prayer. O you sons of men, bow long, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? That's the one I told you about uh, in, in, uh, in the prophecy. Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will, he will hear when I call unto him. So David's making a statement. He's making a couple statements. He's under persecution. He's looking for acceptance. He's not being accepted in his homeland. They're kicking him out. He is the king, his, so his own son, his own family. And he's facing rejection. And he's facing fear. Let's not forget Absalom believes God is on, on his side. He believes God's blessing him. He's praying to the, to the same God David's praying to. This is not some heathen. This is a guy who believes in God also. So will God hear David or will he hear Absalom? Who will he accept the prayers from? I remember going down south when I was living in the north. We were going on vacation to Florida way back when. And I remember we only had a couple of days to go to vacation. It was a tight schedule. We were driving down. And so I was praying all the way down, God, just make it be sunny in Florida. I want it to be sunny. Don't make it rain any place. And when I was driving down, I thought of the fact of, what if there's some farmers in Florida that are praying for rain? <laughs> Is that not conflicting? How does God deal with that? How does he deal with somebody praying, I want rain, and same, 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 another Christian's praying, I want, I want sunshine? Well, obviously, they're praying for something. They're praying there for the same God. Now, there's a, there's a case of righteousness here and unrighteousness, obviously. God will not hear the unrighteous. Somebody say amen. So listen, God has a covenant with David. He has a covenant. He has no covenant at this time with Absalom. That's very, very important. We're going to springboard off of that for a moment. So not yet, anyway. Second Chronicles. Chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel, should not you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt. So what he did is he gave it to David first. It's a progression. David gets the promises of God. It's called the Old Covenant because it's the Old Promises. The New Covenant is the New Promises. Covenant means promises. So David was giving this covenant, this promise of God. How many of you know that God cannot lie? Amen. That he has to fulfill. So he gives it to him by salt. Now I was going to do this tonight, but I didn't have enough time. I was going to get you all a bag of salt. Because salt is a, was something they exchanged in covenant form. And so I want you, I want to just get you to a little bit, a little understanding of it. So when Jesus talks about us being salt, I want you to understand what covenant means and why he said that. So I was going to give you a salt bag, which I'm not going to do it. So his sons, David's sons, could not supersede him as king. As long as he's alive, the covenant's to him first. God passes it down. I don't understand that. So they can't supersede him. Absalom's not under the covenant here. He's not under the promises of God. So we see that David had to pass his bag down to them, if you will. Let me just show you a couple of things. Jesus said this to us. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot by men. So we think of salt as preservative, and it is, and that's why we think this verse. But there's more to that verse. What Jesus is telling us is that you are part of the covenant. You are, the, you are the promise of God. And so basically, you cannot, lose your fit, you cannot lose your flavor. You can't lose your passion for God because you're the promise of God to go to other men. You're the promise. That, here's plan A. You're God's plan A. He has promised you many, many things, and he wants you to keep that promise and bring it to other men. That's why he's talking to us about salt. It goes all the way back. Jesus is a Jew. He knows about the salt covenant. They would carry little bags of salt. The Romans, when they would come over, would carry little bags of salt. Salt was used as money. 
you have a word that has to do with that. It's called salary. It comes from the word salt. It, it, so what they would do is they would pass their, they would buy things with salt because when you lived back then, there was no, there were no refrigeration. There was no refrigeration. So salt preserved things. So it made you live because you preserved meats. You preserved a lot of things. It was your lifeblood. So it became very valuable. And Roman soldiers were actually paid in salt. You've heard somebody say, he's not worth his weight in salt. Okay, so there's a lot of different things that we hear by salt. Salarium, it's, all, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's a, that's a peace spot. It's something that, that is purchased as peace. And so salt was, was collected in bags. Now here's the deal. If you wanted to have a salt covenant, basically, well, let me just tell you the meaning and value of salt for a second. Salt was used for money in ancient times. The word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which means salt money, and referred to the allowance of salt that was paid to Roman soldiers. Even today in some parts of the world, salt is one of the most prized commodities. It is still valued as a condiment and preservative, along with essentially to the body. And so uh, we know that. And it's interesting to me that one of the best salts you could ever find is in the Dead Sea in Israel. It's one of the best salts you'll ever find. It's, it's therapeutic. People go there from all over the world just to put that salt on them. So it's kind of interesting. Salt in Israel has a very big, uh, very big uh, marriage, if you would. So here's what they would do when they'd enter into a covenant. If I were making a covenant with you, you had a salt bag and I had a salt bag. I'd take some salt out of my salt bag and I'd put it in your salt bag and you'd take some salt out of yours and you put it in mine and then we make our promise to each other. The reason we did that is it's impossible for me to go out and get those grains of salt that's in your bag. I have no idea where those grains are because they're mixed in. So our promises become mixed together. It becomes one. It becomes one. How many are getting this? So they exchange salt. When Menachem Begum and, uh, and Amwar Sadat signed a joint accord, and this didn't, go, this didn't happen in the news when they it, because they never even knew what it was about. When they signed an accord at Camp David, they exchanged salt, by the way. And so that meant that they were never going to, they both knew it meant, they were never going to break that accord. And so we see a salt covenant is very powerful, and God makes it, makes one with David. Uh, so David prays to God. Now, again, out of his intricate involvement with him, out of his covenant, he knows that God has promised him things. So David addresses God as my righteousness in verse 1. Hear me when I call God of my righteousness, my righteousness, my covenant. You've given me righteousness because it is God who has made his covenant with him. 2 Samuel 7, 15 and 16. I'm weaving the story. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. So as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, thy throne shall be established forever. This is talking to David. It's God promising him. So he's promising him him and then his lineage. It says um, in, in verse 1, it says, you have relieved my distress. It says, you have, you have relieved my distress. It says, you have relieved my distress. You, and listen, it says, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have enlarged me when I was in distress and mercy on me and hear my, pra and hear my prayer. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. So he's saying this. He's saying uh, his perfect logic, David's, is this. God, you did it before. So you can do it again for me. You enlarge me once, and you can enlarge me again. You gave me mercy once, and you can give it to me again. I'm under the covenant. So I know that you've promised me certain things, so I have a right to ask God. You've done it before. You've accepted my problems before, and because your covenant accepted me. And sin, now since your covenant, which never changes, accepted me in the past, and, accepted, and delivered me in the past, and rescued me in the past, it has to rescue me now. That's a promise. David is holding God accountable to his past actions, and at the same time, encouraging himself concerning God's future deliverance. He's talking to himself. He's saying, God has helped me before. He has to help me again. He promised me certain things, and he's not a liar. So, uh, so even though I feel stress, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he promised something to me, it doesn't matter how I feel. Come on, are you with me tonight? Yep. It doesn't matter how bad I feel. It doesn't matter if I feel threatened. It doesn't matter if I feel stressed. God is the one that has the burden of this promise. He's going to take me out of it. David is encouraging himself. Listen, David's getting out of his nightmare. David's getting to the point of saying, God, you are doing something for me because you've always done something for me because you gave me a promise, God. And I'm relying on that promise. You have to rescue me now. Psalm 4, verses 2 and 3 are pretty interesting when you see it. And it says, verse 2, it says, Oh, you sons of men, I know we're going over. How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah, Psalm 4 says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. That's the covenant. The Lord will hear when I call him. That's the covenant. He is, he is bound to hear you because he has a promise to hear you. Now watch. So, carnal men like Absalom, even though he's born into the religion and he's praying to the same God, God does not have to hear him. Because he's not under a covenant. By the way, 
we know that he's accepting David. When we read this, when we read about this, about him, I, uh, the Lord will hear when I call. David's not saying you may hear. He's saying you will hear because we're under a covenant. Now acceptance, listen, acceptance in verse 3, set apart, sanctified. It means that Satan can't touch God's anointed. Amen. He can't. Satan cannot touch him. He can tempt us, but he can't touch us. He can't go between the covenants. It's impossible for him to get between the covenant. He'd have to be stronger than God. How many are with me tonight? Not the Lord might hear me when I call. Not the Lord probably will hear me when I call. Or not the ho I hope the Lord will hear me when I call. I hear jokes all the time. Lord, you know, if you're up there and th this and that, and I won't bother you again. Listen, this is not anything to do with the covenant. The covenant is, God, this is what you said, and I believe it. I believe it every day of my life. It's the Lord will hear me when I call to him. So say it. The Lord, the Lord will hear me, will hear me when, I call. when I call. Say it one more time. The Lord, the Lord will hear me. Will hear me when I call. So every time you pray to God, don't ever doubt it. Because you, you have a covenant with Him. Secondly, assurance. Verse 4 to 5. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. David's speaking to himself. He's talking to himself. He's telling himself, he's assuring himself of what he just said. Uh, uh, that assurance gives us personal, God gives us personal assurance. Uh, there are, these are commands given to bring us assurance. David says, this is what you need to do. If you don't have assurance that God's going to hear you, this is what you need to do. You need to be angry and sin not. To meditate and be still. To offer sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. That's what David is telling us. Be angry and sin not. Verse 4. It says, be angry and sin not. Stand in awe and sin not. Be angry is one translation. Sin not. You can be angry at the things that are happening to you, but don't sin. Don't blame God. It says, listen, you be angry, but don't sin. Meditate and be still. Give God a chance to listen to you. And offer sacrifices, which means you put your trust into the Lord. Was he angry? Was God angry at Noah's generation? Of course he was. Was he angry at, at uh, Nimrod and of course he was. Was he angry at the wandering Israelites? Yes. Angry at the idolatrous Israel? Yes. But God's anger isn't an emotional anger. You know, the, the anger, even if David's talking about his own anger or God's anger, we're not sure which one he's talking about here, but God's anger is not an emotional anger. When we get angry, it's emotional. God's anger is a moral anger. Whole different thing. This, it says, it isn't right. This is against God. There's a difference between, between godly anger and emotional anger. You can have godly anger. Godly anger is perfectly okay for you to have. And so let me just show it to you. So the message puts those verses like this first. Complain if you must. Be angry. But don't lash out. Keep your mouth shut. Let your heart do the talking. Build your case before God and wait for his verdict. Amen. So let me re repeat this. David's angry. Would you not be angry? Your son has taken your kingdom. He's defiled your concubines. He's taken a lot of your people. You're on the run. Even though God's made you promises, you're out in the wilderness running. He's angry. But it says, don't lash out. You'll watch David. He'll get angry at a lot of things, and he won't lash out. He was angry at Saul, but he never lashed out. Keep your mouth shut. Let your heart do the talking. Build your case before God, and wait for his verdict. Man, if that is not sound spiritual logic, I don't know what is. So... Let me put it to you in Mark Corellian terms, okay? Emotional anger versus godly anger. I wrote a little chart for you. Emotional anger leads to rage and violence. Godly anger leads to petition God's peace. Big difference. And I get angry. I don't want to get angry so I'm emotionally lashing out at somebody. I want to get angry at things that are godly. I want to get angry and I want to petition God. God, that's not right. That shouldn't be done, God. I want to tell God. I want to, I want to commune with God when I get angry. I mean, you know what I'm talking about here. You're wasting your anger on people. Amen. Your anger should go to God. And not at God, to God. God, I'm angry at this. I need you to help me. Don't you know David's saying, God, this isn't right. Absalom's defiling the covenant. I'm angry, God. God, do something about this. That's how many are with me. How many of you feel that sometimes in your own situations in life? Come on, this is going to be applicable to many of you tonight. Be angry and sin not. So, look at what follows anger. Meditation, stillness, offer the sacrifices. What's David referring to? In Psalm 27, 6, it says this. It says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain Oh, that's verse 4. Remain silent. That's the same one. So he's saying that, and he's talking about offering these uh, these. Think about overnight. It's offering sacrifices to God. Now, what are those sacrifices? Well, it's, it's believe it or not, Psalm 27, uh, 6 says, sacrifices of joy. 
It says praise when, when pursued and rejoicing when reviled. So the sacrifices that you offer are to praise God when somebody goes against you and is angry with you, to praise Him when you're pursued by somebody, and to sacrifice joy, to the sacrifices of joy. It's to offer those to God. It's to say, God, these are yours. I want to praise you. I want to find the joy in you. And I want to rejoice when I'm reviled. So those are sacrifices. You offer those to God and say, God, now take care of my problem. Take care of what's going on. Our assurance during the times of stress is this. The godly trust the Lord. And the Lord hears the godly. Lastly, absoluteness. And by the way, another translate verse 5. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Absoluteness. Verses 46. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up thy light of thy countenance upon us. And I think of Israel in 1904 there, and I also think of David. And I think of us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their, the corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. So David is going through his nightly devotions. He's working through his anger. He's working through his emotional problems. He's petitioning God. He's looking for assurance from God. And now he's finally coming to a spot where he has an absoluteness. He is resolved right now. He is understanding what's going on. David doesn't end his prayer with a call to trust in the Lord. The objections of the crowd now come into his mind. And so basically we see this in verse 6. We see... There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. He's saying, shine upon us. He's actually gone, saw, thought about his enemies, and he said, shine upon me. You know, when your enemies hurt you, or when something hurts you, who really needs help is you. You need to be able to absorb it. You need to be able to have an absoluteness saying, God, I'm going to make it through here. You know, life, I told this to somebody the other day, they were, looked at me strange. Life is really not that important. I mean, what do you get so messed up about? And why? Why do you get such drama? Why do we get such drama in our life? Tomorrow's going to come. You know, if I bump my head and I was no longer, life's going to go on Amen. without me, whether I like it or not. So life, we should never take life as seriously as we do. David's, David's trying to get to this point. He's trying to say, man, I'm pressured all around. All this pressure is making me take everything so serious. He's wanting out of the pressure. You can make a decision to do that tonight. You can say, wait a second. Tomorrow will show up, whether I think it won't or, or will, will. Do you ever notice when you're really, really young, you worry about everything? When you're old, you kind of like, I don't know, something happens to you. How many of you ever noticed that? You just kind of like, you yeah, know, that's all right. It'll happen. It'll work. I remember with children. Our first child was born, and uh, Mark, and he skinned his knee. It was like, oh, my goodness. Should we call the paramedics? Should we bring him to the hospital? Let's check his heartbeat. The second one, the second one skinned her knee and was like, oh, boy, we should probably get a band-aid. The third one was like, eh, walk it off, Bethany. You'll be all right. <laughs> we need to realize that, basically, we take life too seriously sometimes. We need to be serious spiritually. We don't need to let things mess us up in life because the enemy will do his best to do that. So it's great to get all excited tonight and Sunday morning, but what about when the, all the evil and the problems come in your life? What about when they're waiting for you out there or, to, or tomorrow? Look at how David comes to grip with it. Lord, lift up the light of your countenance. L literally, light my face up with your face. That's what it means, says. Let me see your light. You see, the cry is met by a call. And listen, again, salt you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world you see we just heard about salt covenant i told you about the salt and now he's asking for his light you are the light of the world the city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden john 11 1, 9 to 10 jesus answered are there not 12 hours of daylight man who walks by the day will not stumble for he sees the world's light it's when he walks by night that he stumbles and he has no light. That's why you and I get troubled at night. Because the nighttime makes us try to stumble. But Jesus says, you don't have to have any nighttime in your life. You can let the light of God's countenance shine on you all day long and all night long. So when you get up at night, here's the deal. When you get up at night and you're in stress, pull out your Bible and read Psalm 4. I promise you, whatever you've been thinking about is going to be absorbed with, Paul, with Psalms 4 because it's just for that. It's for a night of stress. This is where you put your pills away and you trust God. David's getting excited. His joy level is rising. He's seeing the big picture. In this, nothing will stop God's will from coming about. God will have his way with or without men. Let me repeat it. 
God will have his way with or without men. It's absolute. You see, there is safety only in the Lord alone. That's the absoluteness. The absoluteness of this psalm is that the only trust you can have is you can't trust in man. You can't trust in riches. You can't trust in your friends. Your friends can up and die. You can't even trust in your spouse. That may sound strange. How many of you know how long your spouse is going to live? You don't. What if they're not here tomorrow? You're going to have to trust in God. Your trust has to come in God. Every single moment of your life, your trust has to come in God. I know those are hard words to hear, but David has to get to that point because he can't trust in his son. He can't trust in any of his wives anymore. He can't trust in Ahithophel, who used to be his counselor. He can't trust in the people in Jerusalem. Who's he going to trust? Well, he knows better than to trust the people that are around him. Even though he has some faith in them, his ultimate trust has to come in God. So in verse 7, he says something. You have filled my heart with greater joy. How in the world is that possible? How is it possible to be in anguish in the beginning of this psalm and to end up in greater joy? How is it possible for you to get up at night and be terrified or messed up by something you're thinking about and go back to bed and be in better shape than when you woke up? That's what he's saying. It's God. It's all God. It's concentrating on God. God is our, have you noticed that God's our answer for everything? Amen. Have you noticed that? How in the world does the world exist? How do, how do you unsay? Let me ask people out there in, in um, media land. How do you live without knowing God? How do you exist without knowing God? Why are you not pulling your hair out at every turn? God's the only answer for us. David said, Lord, the joy of your presence is more than that of the harvest. When he says the grain and the wine increase. It's more because we are dealing with the creator rather than the creation. It's more because we are dealing with the Christ, not the crop. It's more because we are dealing with the person of God, not the produce of God. The consequences of this presence are sleep and serenity. What happens to all of David's pressures and stress? Well, Psalm 8 says, In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. I promise you, if you use this when you, when you are having something bothering you, let's take that one more time. How many have ever woken up, woke up with something on your mind that was troubling you? Do, just promise me tonight... Say, I'm going to ask you to say, I promise. Okay? That you'll put a Bible next to your bed. I promise. And that you'll open it to Psalm 4. I promise. Some of you are slacking off. I promise. And now when you're really terrified and you wake up, you'll read that Psalm. I promise. How many? Honestly, it's going to help you. How many believe me in that? Amen. It helped David. Listen. It gave way to peace and safety. Security in times of stress. If you can hear this tonight, then listen. It doesn't matter who's chasing you tonight. It doesn't matter what you've lost or given up. It doesn't matter what caused you to run away. It doesn't matter what your plans are to survive. It doesn't matter what evil has tried to conquer you or tried to trap you. There's a couple of lessons we need to hear tonight. As I put it from the message, let me give you that before I give you the lessons. Listen. Why is everyone hungry for more? More, more, they say. More, more. I have God's more than enough. More joy in one ordinary day than they get in all their shopping sprees. You've got to love the message. At day's end, I'm ready for sound sleep. For you, God, have put my life back together. Amen. It's a very loose translation, but it's pretty neat. It's like, you know, people are so worried about everything. They're worried about accumulating. They're worried about bills. They're worried about bringing things into their house. I mean, they're worried about so many things. He says, man, my, my life stays together only by God. So what are our lessons from Psalm 4? Here it is. Have you ever had a sleepless night because of anxiety and problems weighing you down? Maybe they were brought on by your enemies, finances, or family, or even church trouble. That's the worst kind of trouble sometimes. Then you know where David was in Psalm 4. Even when torn by physical and emotional pain, one can still have restful sleep in God's presence. That's, a, that's weird to the world. Psalm 4, 8, message of the psalm brings sleep to the psalmist. How can we find sleep on those sleepless nights? Count your blessings. Psalmist faced a pressing need, but his confidence in God remained strong. David is remembering the relief God gave him from distresses in the past. Count your deliverances. Count your blessings. Focus on God. David had a choice. Focus on men who were lying about him or focus on God who had set him apart. That is a big statement right there. We have the same choice. There are some references in Ephesians. So tonight, let me end with this. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. To the chief musician on Neganoth. By the way, I was going to teach you that tonight. It's a stringed instrument that David created. We will get to that again. I, I don't have enough time to teach it tonight. A psalm of David. Hear me when I cry, a call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Psalm 4. 
Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. So what he's talking about from the whole, whole psalm is confidence in the, in the righteousness of God. God has to be right there. Confidence in the righteousness of God. Tonight, when you leave here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your car, and I don't know if you have time to do it. I want you to just put your hand on the wheel before you ever start off. And, you know, there's no, there's no guarantee that you're going to go home tonight safely. I want to put your hand on that car and say, God, I have confidence in you in everything I do, including drive, just do it once, including driving this car home. You ha I have confidence in you that everything I do in my life, you are part and you are fiber of that, of what I do. Man, I get excited just thinking about that. Tonight, the apple of his eye. I've taught this many, many times. If I get real close to you, just happen to be in the front seat, and I look right in your pupil, I'm going to see this little white spot. And in that white spot, I'm going to see my reflection. That's called the apple of your eye. So God says we are the apple of his eye. That means if you can look deep into God's eyes today, you'd see yourself. He cares about you. Tonight, would you just bow your heads to me for a moment? Somebody said to me, oh, you're going to Israel. Oh, my goodness, aren't you afraid? I said, um, I said, they said, aren't you afraid to fly that far? I said, no, I sit in the back of the plane. They said, well, why? I said, well, you never heard of a plane backing into a mountain, have you? <laughs> they said, no, seriously, aren't you afraid? I said, no, I'm not afraid. They said, well, what about, aren't you afraid of when you get there? And I said, no, nope, I'm not afraid. And they said, well, why aren't you afraid? Don't you know what happens there? I said, yep, know what happens there, know what happens in Birmingham. Know what's, but my life is ordered by God. Amen. And listen, if God wants me, and the day comes, I could be in a plane or I could be in my closet. It doesn't matter. God's going to take me. Tonight, you have to have confidence in God. It's the, it's the essence of Christianity. Because the enemy is going to try that confidence in everything happens in your life. Whether it's sickness or finances or anything or troubles, he's going to try that confidence. That's what our faith is. It's that confidence in God. Father, I just thank Would you stand with me just for a moment as we pray? Tonight, let me ask a question. If we can bow our heads just for a moment, just to give some people some privacy. Sometimes we do this. If you're here tonight, man, you needed this tonight because there's some things kind of shaking you up a little bit in your world. Would you raise your hand real high? Just raise it up. Man, hands all over the place. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for the confidence we have in you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that you have taken our needs, you have taken our burdens, Lord, and that you have given us your promise, your covenant, the new covenant. You, Lord God, have told us that we are the salt. We are the promise of God. You've mixed yourself with us, and we are the value in this world. We are what the world needs. We are the, we are the salary. We are the, we are the wages. We are the payday of this world. If they would only take, Lord God. I'm thankful that we are mixed together, and your promises can never be untaken or taken out of our bag. Lord God. I thank you that we have the light of the world. And tonight, Lord God, let us go home assured. Tonight, if there's anyone, Lord, that has restful sleep, if there's anyone, Lord God, that needs you in the middle of the night, let them read this psalm, realize what David said, and let them solidly say, I have confidence in you, my God. I will rest in peace. I will lay my, my head down in peace. Lord, give them a better sleep than they've ever had. Bless them now, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Listen.